Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thanks, Becky. My name's Dave. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, I think I'll, I'll end now, actually. Get a round of applause at the beginning. That's uh, sort of downhill from now, I guess. But the, uh, uh, thanks for asking me. I'm, I'm pleased to be here, and I'm pleased and very grateful to be clean and sober today. Um, you know, it's always a pleasure to be asked to do any kind of service in AA. And if it's within my power to to do what I'm asked to do, I will. I will. I will do that. You know, I um, I've found the benefits of AA in my life over the years that I've been sober, um, to be immense, really. And what it provides me with today, you know, I haven't had a drink for 13 years. You know, I don't, I don't think necessarily I'm going to have a drink today, you know. But what it provides me with is a perfect vehicle to get out of self. You know, I can come here and AA gives me a vehicle, a structure in my life to be able to uh, try and help somebody else and as a result of that, uh, ease my self-centeredness. And it seems to work perfectly as that vehicle. You know, I've, I've um, uh, in the years that I've been coming, I've found no no good reason to leave. You know, I, I know people do leave. You know, and people do different things and stuff like that. And you know, what other people do is entirely up to them. But I I've stayed and I and I enjoy it. Um, so today, uh, I mean, you've got three hours of me talking, which is a long time. You know. And uh, one of the questions you get asked by new, newer people is, you know, how on earth do you find things to talk about for three hours? And then when you when you go around to be around as long as I have, you think, well, actually, I need to cut some bits out. And, uh, you yeah, know, uh, like a lot of AAs, I guess, you know, I can talk a lot. And uh, those of you that know me will, will, will attest to that, I'm sure. But uh, what qualifies me to do this, uh, for those of you that don't know me, I think the, the main qualification I have is that I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was asked to do it. And I think that, um, you know, I don't think that there's anything particularly special about me that enables me to sit and talk for three hours when maybe somebody else doesn't get asked to do that. But, uh, you know, how do I manage my ego within that framework? I'll just do what I'm told. You know, it can be very, the speaker in AA can be a dangerous job. You know, to, to sit up here and think that I have knowledge that can uh, change people's lives or I'm going to impart wisdom that means that uh, you're going to have an improved recovery and that's all down to me. It's a very dangerous idea. You know, so I find that the way that I manage that dynamic is that I, uh, I only do what I'm asked to. You know, someone says to me, come and speak about sponsorship, I'll come and speak about sponsorship. Someone says, come and speak about the seventh tradition, I'll go and speak about the seventh tradition. And I, and I endeavour, wherever possible, to uh, limit what I say to my personal experience rather than what I might believe or my opinions about things. But within today, there maybe will be some belief and opinion, because sometimes that dialogue could be useful um, to, to tell you how I got where I was, you know, where I am currently. So that's my main qualification. In terms of specifically with sponsorship, um, I've, I've, I've been a sponsor um, for about 11 years, 11 and a half years, uh, to other people. Um, and I've had four sponsors myself in my time in recovery. So I, I, I'll endeavour to speak about both sides of that dynamic. I think they, they kind of, you can't have one without the other in some respects. Um, and I've probably heard, uh, I think at the last count, it's somewhere in the region of about 110 fifth steps. So I've worked with a lot of people, you know, and that, that doesn't mean that I'm any better than anybody else. That's just the path that's been presented to me in my journey in recovery. And uh, but what it does mean is when you've sat with so many people and heard so much stuff, it does give you stuff that you can share to help maybe people that don't and haven't had that experience. So that, I guess, is my qualification to be here. Um, if anything that I say uh, is at odds with what you currently believe, your current practice, or um, anything that uh, you know that you think is right for you, um, please endeavour not to take that personally. I'm not here to convince you that what I do is the only way or the right way. Um, you know, a few years ago, I might have been here to do that. You know, because where I was in my personal recovery um, meant that I actually felt that a lot of people were doing it wrong. You know, and uh, I've overcome that barrier personally, and you know, I've come to understand that actually I don't think there is a right or wrong actually to go about this because uh, people are very different. You know, I think one of the the wonders of life for me is the understanding about the human being is that everybody's unique, everybody's different. 
Uh, there aren't two human beings the same in the world. You know, I know, I know several sets of identical twins who have the same genetic makeup. You know, they came from the same egg. So genetically, they're the same. But if you speak to them, they're different. They have different ideas about things, they have different beliefs. The way that they've lived their life may be different, and things like that. The human beings are unique. And the chances of all of you human beings being here, sitting in a chair, being who you are currently today, is, is the odds are infinite. Right? You can't actually compute them. It's an infinite thing. Right, that that could be a possibility. But I find that immensely mm -hmm. exciting. You know, immensely exciting that there are no two human beings the same. We're all having a very unique experience of life from our own perspectives and our own way of living. And uh, nobody else can have that experience. So you can love other people, you can have other people share your life with you, but nobody else can live your life as you. Right? It's wonderful, isn't it? You know, so understanding that has enabled me to have respect what other people want to do, choose to do, want to believe, or do believe. You know, and I, I no longer try and convince people that I'm right and they're wrong. And that's been a blessed relief for me. You know, it creates less suffering in me to come from that position. So if, you, if you're here and you feel yourself getting moved to a position of defensiveness because it's what I'm saying, maybe it's challenging what you currently <coughs> believe, you know, don't take it personally. But sometimes when you get them challenges, you know, and uh, I've had it, you know, I've been in conventions, um, various places around the world where the speaker's been saying things and it's kind of, I feel myself bristle a little bit you know, because I'm thinking that's not quite right you know, that's not how I see it and sometimes after the convention or maybe in the tea break I'll get a moment to reflect and I think, well, why, why, why was I getting so defensive about that? Why, why was that making me angry? And sometimes I've, I've changed my mind you know, my beliefs have changed I've experienced complete consciousness shifts while sitting in chairs in conventions now, I'll go to a convention, the speaker will be talking. After an hour of listening to the speaker, I'm in tears. Because what I, what I believed before I sat down has changed whilst I've been sitting there. And so, you know, again, I guess the recommendation from this speaker would be to try and sit with an open mind. Um, you might learn something, you might not. So, uh, that's the opening caveat. So, uh, the, the way I'm going to try and do this today is... Um, <coughs> speak for this first session just generally about my experiences with sponsorship. So um, what it was like to be a sponsee, um, how I initially felt about them experiences and things like that, and then how I've become the sponsor that I currently am. But I think it's a, for me it's always been a work in progress. You know, I've, uh, the way that I approach sponsorship has changed over the years that I've been sober. You know, as more has been revealed to me as I've kind of got to work with stuff and practice stuff in different ways. And then the second hour after lunch, I'm going to um, endeavour to answer some of the common questions that I've been asked over the years um, about some of the pitfalls of sponsorship, some of the things that people are uncertain about, the general queries that occur. And then I'll open that up for some questions from the floor as well, that second session. And then the last session, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a big book and I'm going to sit here and I'm going to show you exactly how I go through the big book with a new person. Um, Maybe some of that would be helpful. So my, uh, I came to AA. Um, I took my last drink on August, up until today, on August the 24th, 1998. And, uh, you know, to me it seems like a long time ago now. You know, when, I, when I talk about my drinking stories in recovery, sometimes it's like I talk about someone different. It's, it doesn't really feel like me anymore. You know, the changes that have happened in me and in my life in recovery... I uh, mean that when I look back on the person that I used to be, it's almost like looking at somebody else. And so I've got the language to talk about the stories and stuff like that, but quite often I'm not connected emotionally to that anymore. It's kind of, it's just a narrative, you know. But I'm aware that that narrative can be helpful. You know, so when I came here, I was in a terrible state. You know, I was uh, suffering from my alcoholism. And um, very mentally unwell and looking for something different, you know. And I didn't know that when I first came to AA that that would involve not ever drinking again. You know, I, I figured that maybe I could find a way to not drink for a while, improve my mental health, get access to my daughter, improve things at work, you know, the kind of life management stuff that was kind of falling apart around me. And, uh, you know, but I don't think I, I came here with the idea that I would never drink again. And in my early meetings in, in Alcoholics Anonymous, I got hope. 
I heard people talk about drinking like the way that I drank. I heard people talking about feeling the way that I felt. I heard people talking about doing some of the things that I used to do whilst I was drinking. And it helped, I understand now that that helped ease some of my separation. In my sense of separation, because I, I never knew that there were other people that kind of had that stuff going on. You know, I was a very isolated human being. You know, I could be in a room surrounded by people and feel completely alone. And in AA, that first, the first few meetings was the first time I'd felt like maybe there were some people like me in the world. You know. And it gave me hope. And I continued to come to AA. And after a period of a few weeks in AA, a miracle occurred. And I completely recovered from alcoholism. And um, I went from being that kind of hopeful individual that came to them first few meetings and returned and reverted to what is, I guess, my natural state of mind and being, which is extremely arrogant and judgmental. And I sat in meetings being extremely arrogant and judgmental in my head. You know, not to you. You know, I'd smile at you and, you know, be polite. My mum brought me up to be polite, you know. So, but in my head, I'm thinking, what a bunch of losers, you know, badly dressed. Some of you were really old. You know. Some of you didn't really seem to have much else going on other than AA. You know, I, I felt a bit of pity for you about that. And, uh, you know, I was, well, I look back now, you know, I, I can kind of see why that was, you know. But uh, at the time, it, it felt like I was right and you was all wrong. Yeah. People talked about sponsorship, not often. You know, I didn't hear it a lot in AA. When I, I got sober in this area, and uh, you know, the, the kind of things that you hear in meetings now has changed in my time in AA. And sometimes I ask, is is that my perception? Right? Is that is that just that I'm remembering it in a certain way, and that isn't actually what happened? So I asked other people who got sober at the same time that I did, and we agree, actually, no, there wasn't a lot of talk about sponsorship in the meetings. You know, there certainly wasn't much talk about God. And uh, very few people had seemed, seemingly had worked the steps. And those that had, um, in a general way, talked about it as being a really tough thing to do. You know, I can remember people talking about spending years writing a full step and things like that. So it sounded like quite a laborious kind of option, you know. So I'm sitting there like, three or four weeks sober thinking, well, what does this really mean to me then? I've got this laborious option that doesn't really seem to do much anyway, and nobody really seems to think, you know, and so I didn't really bother with it. You know, if, it if it's an easier path, or an apparently easier path, I will choose that. A path that requires no work, or a path that seems to require effort and work, I'll choose the path that requires no work. You know, that makes, that makes perfect sense to me. And so I didn't get a sponsor, um, I didn't think there was anyone in AA who could sponsor me anyway, because I figured I was probably more intelligent than the rest of you. And, um, you know, I figured that I'd be sponsored by Marlborough Light. That's what I thought. I like Marlboroughs. And, uh, you know, other people got sponsored by Marlborough, and they're racing drivers and things like that. So I thought that's what I'd do. I'd be sponsored by Marlborough. And uh, I, I didn't read the big book. You know, I opened the, uh, my first big book I bought when I was three, three weeks sober. <laughs> And um, we were getting it home that night, and uh, sitting in my bed, and I opened it up, and it said it was written in 1939, and I immediately thought, this book can't teach me anything. See, I've got a psychology degree, so this book don't, can't teach me nothing. And um, I looked through the, the contents page, and there was a story near the back called Freedom from Bondage. It was quite late at night, and I thought, well, that might be... <laughs> <laughs> that might be an interesting read and uh, I read the, the first few pages of A Freedom From Bondage and it wasn't what I thought it was going to be yeah. <laughs> uh, and I closed that book and it actually stayed under my bed propping my bed up, it was a bit of a wonky bed and, and it stayed there for uh, the first 18 months of my recovery and um, you know so my my initial introduction to AA didn't involve the things that I now see as important you know, because of the way I was and possibly because of the way the fellowship was at the time. It was made quite easy for people to come in and not work the steps and kind of do that stuff. I can remember talking to a bloke at a meeting. There was a third meeting I went to and I said, what's all this God stuff about? 
you know, I was an atheist, I was an educated atheist, you know, I used to like arguing with people about God, you know, but I wouldn't listen to their side, I'd only tell them mine, and, uh, you know, and he said to me, don't worry about that Dave, it's all a load of bollocks, sorry for my language, that's what he said, I'm uh, quoting. And I thought, oh, well, excellent, you know, and I can remember uh, periods in my recovery getting angry about that, you know, when I when I kind of had different experiences later on, I'm thinking, you know, that bloke sold me down the, down the road, didn't he, saying that, you know. It was out of order, him saying that to me. But again, I got to reflect on that, and I think that if he'd have said anything else, you know, I'd have probably left. Or maybe I would have been less interested in staying. So maybe he did tell me what I needed to hear, you know. And so I'm, I'm careful about my judgments today, you know, about what other meetings do or other people do and things like that. Because I don't know what the big picture is for each and every one of you. You know, for some of you in here, suffering will be required for you to live your life. Suffering will be required for you to find a solution. I'm not going to deny you that opportunity to suffer, if that's what you want to do. So my initial uh, experiences with AA were, were, were kind of interesting, really, but masked by my arrogance. And um, I carried on like that for a while, and in the end I decided to leave AA. Because if you're an atheist going to AA, right, who's not interested in getting a sponsor, doesn't want to do any service, doesn't even really want to be in the meeting, right, doesn't want to put any money in the pot, really, or to begrudge that, even though it was only a pound, you know. It was like my, that was a, that's how I absolved my conscience. Well, I'm not doing any service, but I'll put a pound in, so that's my bit. The you know. AA doesn't offer much, really. I didn't really like you. you know. I could see that some of you were quite genuine, but I was also quite suspicious of a lot of you. you know, a, lot, a lot of people, I thought, what's their angle? You know, because I judged you with the way that I was. See, I was always on an angle. I was always playing people. You know, I'd only do something for somebody else if there was something in it for me. You know, I was the kind of bloke in the pub that I'd lend you a fiver on a Wednesday night knowing that you was getting paid on Friday that I could tap you for a score. Yeah. So sometimes in AA, this is the kind of, you know, the, the over-happy individual wants to shake your hand, give you a lift home and stuff like that. I was like, you stay away from me. You want my phone number? No chance. <laughs> And uh, life carried on. I left AA. I remember sitting at work one day thinking to myself, I've been sober about uh, about 10 months at this point. And uh, I can remember thinking, you haven't drank, Dave, you know, and things like that, but life's still not that great. You know, things still aren't really going the way that you'd like. You really need to make some changes in your life. Maybe you should drop out of that AA. Yeah. You haven't drank for a while. All they do is talk about drinking, and you don't really like them anyway. So why why'd you go? I thought to myself, I've got no idea why I go. I'm not going to go. And I stopped going. And I, I carried on without AA for eight months. And because I've only lived my life, I'm a unique human being, uh, like all of you are, yeah? I, I don't know what it's like to live like somebody else, see? I don't, I don't know what it's like to live a different life. I've only had my experience. Because my experience of coming to AA and putting down the drink, things were slightly better than they were when I was drinking, in a physical sense and in a mental sense. You know, the, the main symptoms of my mental health problems went away. My physical health improved because I wasn't drinking alcohol. I thought that was all that was here, all that was on offer. I didn't know that there was an alternative, you know, a way of feeling good. I didn't know that. And I've never really felt good, only artificially. I didn't know that either. Yeah. So I'd only felt the way that I felt. And so I struggled on thinking that it was okay, that this was it, this is all there was. And what happened to me is after 18 months without a drink, I reached what I now uh, understand was my rock bottom. And at that time in my life, externally, things were better than they'd been for a long time. I had a job, I had a car, living in a better place than I had been living in. I had access to my daughter, um, you know, I got fit physically, you know, things like that. I was kind of, to the external world, so it seemed, things would seem to be going okay. But internally, I just felt complete despair. And I reached the point of suicidal depression, where I 
decided that the only way that I could change the way that I felt, knowing that alcohol and drugs were not an option for me any longer, was to end my life. And, um, you know, I've, I've, uh, I was always quite a positive bloke as a drunk, really. You know, even when I was on the psychiatric unit, I thought things were going to get better, you know. And, uh, yeah, that's the way, I, I guess I was always like that as a child even, you know. And, um, you know, so in my drinking I was never suicidal, not once was I suicidal in my drinking, even though I, you know, I ended up with some terrible conditions, physically and mentally. I never once really considered in depth that ending my life would be the thing to do. You know, I used to think quite regularly about ending other people's lives. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought I was alright, really. Everybody else. Problem. And uh, so after 18 months without a drink to reach this point of wanting to end my life is a, is a significant thing for me. Even now, just to reflect on really that I've reached that point of desperation. You know, and I, I was just talking to uh, somebody before the meeting about a friend of mine who did end his life, you know, as a, a result of this illness. And I know other people that have ended up in that situation, drunk and sober. So I don't, I don't say it lightly, you know, that's, that's my experience is what happened. I decided I didn't have a particularly original plan for ending my life, I did plan it. But that's how you can tell whether someone's serious about this or not, is that they have a plan generally about how they're going to do it. And so I had, I had some pills, and I had some, I had some booze, and, uh, you know, I decided that I was going to do it away from home, so that for some reason I thought that would lessen the burden, or lessen the blow to the people that, that love me. You know, and I ended up 300 miles away from home from a strange series of events. I didn't end up going to where I wanted to go to, but somehow I ended up there. And I booked into a hotel, and I can remember thinking it was a Friday. I can remember thinking, I'm sitting in this hotel room. Maybe you should go to one more meeting of AA. At least then, uh, when people think about what you did on your last day, you know, my mum and dad and things like that. You know, they think, well, at least he had a go, at least he tried to do something. You know, he didn't just give up. And so I rang, uh, I rang the AA uh, helpline thing and asked them if there was a meeting that night. And they said, there was. There's one where I was in the town that I was in that night. <coughs> and it started at half past seven. So I thought, well, I can wait till after that meeting. I can wait till after that meeting before I end my life. And I went to the meeting and there was a bloke there and uh, this bloke, he eventually became my first sponsor. He, he didn't know that at the time, and neither did I. And, um, you know, I sat in the meeting, and uh, it, was, it was apparent that I wasn't really enjoying myself, you know. Uh, and he saw that, you know, he, he was a good AA, really. And, he, and he, he didn't make it a question. After the meeting, he just said, you're coming with me, son, and he kind of put his arm around me and scooped me away. He, well, he didn't ask me. I thought about that a lot, you know, over the years. I was thinking, if he'd have asked the question, would I have gone? I'd probably have made some excuse and not. But on some level, I guess he probably knew that. You know, and he kind of took me hostage, really. He just said, you're coming with me, so he's quite a big bloke. And uh, he put me in his car, and he's driving me around. And he didn't ask me how I was. Well, he didn't need to, did he? He could see. Yeah. And what he'd done, like a good AA, he just talked about himself. You know what seemed like an eternity. And he, he talked in a way that, uh, in the book, in chapter 7, it talks about how to, to approach a new man. And he did that with me. I didn't know he was doing that, but that's what he did. He talked about himself, sharing in a general way, talking about his stories. And as you could see, he was hooking me. He was up in the ante, you know, getting more and more stuff going. And see, and I was in a desperate condition when I met him. You know, to the point that, actually, in, a, in an hour or so's time, I was going to attempt to end my own life. And just that last conversation, that conversation that I had, him talking and me listening to him, was enough to tip me over the edge. It was almost like, he, because he, I felt like he could see through me. It was always that last vestiges of pride. Because if you think about it, suicide's a prideful act, isn't it? Like, it's done out of desperation, but also it's about saying, I'm still going to control the outcome here. I'm not going to surrender. Yeah. And he said to me, you need never feel this bad ever again, son, if you do one simple thing. I said, what? 
you get on your knees and pray and ask for help. He said, what have you got to lose? I had to concede to him on that night I probably wasn't the greatest power in the universe. And after he left me, I said the first oldest prayer I'd said since I was a small child. So please God, if you help me, I don't know what I'm doing. And that promise has come true. I've never felt that bad since that night. The rest of the conversation he had with me was that this program's not broken, you don't have to try and fix it. It worked for you the same as it's worked for a couple of million other blokes. You know. All you gotta do is have a go. He told me my recovery is my responsibility. He said, uh, no one gets sober on your behalf. No one can go to meetings on your behalf. You're the one that has to go and sit in the chair. He said, no one can say your prayers on your behalf. You're the one that has to do that. He said, no one can write that inventory for you. You have to do that. And when the time comes to make them amends, you're the one that's going to have to go out and do that stuff as well. Nobody can do it for you. And rather than being frightened by that, I became, well, I thought about it the following day, it empowered me. Because I realised, I had a moment, see, I had a, what happened to me that night when I surrendered? See, I had a, a moment of complete ego deflation, just a moment. I was able to surrender and ask for help and mean it. And it just shifted my consciousness enough to start to see things differently. So rather than getting angry about this being passed to me, this idea of being responsible for my own recovery, I realised it was empowering. At this moment, I realised that <coughs> what would happen to me would not be dependent upon what you did any of you said to me or did for me, it's entirely dependent on what I was prepared to do. And I came back to AA properly with a different attitude. Took it seriously. I came to meetings every day for quite a long time when I came back. And I got service in the meetings. And that bloke lived a long way away. So I figured he couldn't be my sponsor. I didn't ask him. So I started looking in the meetings. He said to me, look for somebody local then, Dave. That's what you want. Look for someone local. Go to meetings. Listen to what people say. You know. Listen to what they're saying. And when you find someone that you think has got something that you want, then ask him. Which I think is a dangerous thing to say, actually. You know, has he got something you want? You'd have a look and see what his bird's like. <laughs> Whether he's got a nice car. <laughs> That's the way I was thinking at the time. <laughs> And uh, I did hear a bloke, you know, and he, he shared a lot about um, his experience of being adopted as a child, you know. And because I'd been adopted as a child, I thought that, that that was a connection with him that I had. And so I asked him if he'd help me, this bloke. And we met up a couple of times. And on some level I knew it wasn't, it wasn't for me, you know. I can't, I can't say why, I don't know why really. I just knew. I said an instinctive thing. There's nothing wrong with him. He's still sober, as far as I know. And uh, I just knew it wasn't for me. But what it did, when I had that experience with him, is I realised I needed to go back and ask the bloke to help me. You see, the bloke had the courage of his convictions not to say to me after that meeting, just don't pick up the first drink, son. Go to more meetings. Do 90 and 90. But he never said none of them things. He 12 stepped me in a way that meant he showed me what the solution was. He was... He wasn't afraid of his own experience with God. And he offered that to me. And on some level, I wouldn't have had them words to describe it, but instinctively I knew that that was the person I needed to go back to. And so I did. I rang him up and I asked him. And he said, well, I've been waiting for you to ask, son. <laughs> so he, he, he believed you had to ask. Yeah, act of humility. And he said to me, you need to pray every day. He didn't suggest it. He said, you need to pray every day. That's his word. You need to pray every day. So I did. As an atheist, pray every day. And I'll ring him up sometimes and I'll say, Tony, don't it's going to work for me. He says, I don't believe in God. He said, I don't really care if you believe in son, just do it anyway. Yeah. Carried on praying and started to engage himself in the step work. And uh, things started to improve. You know, I couldn't deny it was tangible difference, you know, from where I'd been to where I'd, even after a few months of just doing them simple prayers, please God help keep me sober, things like that, serenity prayer, I started to feel better. And uh, this bloke, I used to go down and see him uh, once a month 
for a weekend, stayed down at his place. And he, he lived down in Cornwall, he used to like surfing and things like that. So it, was, it was handy, really. I think it worked out really well, it was perfect. Yeah. He had got surfboards in his garage, things like that. And, uh, you know, we gradually started to work through the steps. And See, that man, he, as a sponsor, he doesn't sponsor people like I sponsor people now. He, um, he had no structure with what he offered. He left it entirely up to me how I wanted to interpret the book. He never read the book with me. This wasn't the culture of AA at that time in this country. Yeah, there might have been people around that did it like that, I don't know. I, you know, I didn't meet them. But so there was a few of us, I uh, made a few friends in, in recovery at that time. You know, and we kind of worked stuff out together. You know, and, uh, did a step three prayer on my own. Didn't do it with my sponsor, did it on my own. And, uh, my sponsor said to me that, uh, you should write a resentment inventory. And I said to him, well, there's people up this way, Tony, that are writing a life story. And he says, well, I'll do that as well if you want. And that's what I did. You know, I wrote a life story. And a life story wasn't a bad thing to do. You know, but it didn't really teach me anything. I didn't already know. That's the trouble, isn't it? You know, I've lived my life, I know the story. <laughs> oh, I'm good at telling stories. You know, I can dress it up. It should be published, really. I'm glad I burnt it, do you know what I mean? The, the temptation's gone. <laughs> you know, I can remember thinking while I'm writing it, you know, uh, yeah, what, what am I going to do at the, uh, the publishing house reception? <laughs> when, when they offer me a glass of champagne. And I, I thought about what I'd have to say, you know, in that situation. And so he kind of left it up to me, you know. He talked a lot about the big book, my first sponsor, and he, you know, he, he promoted the big book. He used to go to meetings and he'd talk about the book and things like that. And, um, well, I know, I mean, you know, and if you listen to this tone, it's not meant as a negative, but I know it's the only book he's ever read in his life. You know. Because the background he came from wasn't one of, being educated and things like that. And he carried that message to me in the way that he could carry that message to me. So we started to try and work it out. So I wrote this inventory, you know, um, it was the inventory that I wrote. And people, talk, people would be critical of their own inventories, can't they? It wasn't very good, it was this, that and the other. You know, it didn't really matter, it was one that I wrote. And I shared it with him. And uh, on the day that we decided to, to do my fifth step, he uh, was in one of the, he's, he, had a, he had a few caravans in his, on his land, and um, I was just staying in one of them, you know, and I went down there and stuff like that. And uh, he, uh, he said to me, have you finished? I said, yeah. He said, right, okay, we made a time. So I'm sitting in this caravan and I'm waiting for him to come in. And I'm anxious, right? I'm anxious, I've got my pages. Yeah. And I'm anxious. And the reason why I'm anxious is that I, I know I've missed a couple of things out. See, I feared his judgment. I feared, feared all your judgment, really, but particularly him. There's a couple of things that I've done in my life that I didn't really want anybody to know about. And um, he walked into the caravan and he cracked a joke. He said, Oh, caravan's tipping up at the end there, must be the weight of that full step, son, isn't it? He sat down and lit a cigar. Oh, I don't like cigars. So he's already pissing me off. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Got the tea and biscuits out. And he told me a couple of things, you know, that he'd been, he'd been meditating. He told me a couple of things that spooked me a bit, you know. Things that he knew. He said things about me that he couldn't have known. It was, it was strange, really. And, uh, he, uh, he was a, he, he went to a spiritualist church, so he kind of did that stuff and he had, you know, what people's spiritual guides were and things and he never ever promoted that to me and said that I should go there but that's part of his spiritual life. And so he told me a couple of things. You know, so, so I'm anxious thinking that I'm going to not tell him these things and then he spooked me out by telling me a couple of these, this stuff. I right, told me who my spiritual guides were and, and he said a couple of things. What does this mean to you? Does this mean something to you, son? This is what came to me. And I was thinking, oh, does he know that? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, you know, he looked at me and he says, "If you lie to me today, son, 
Will you hold anything back? He says, I probably won't know. Right, but you will. You'll know. And you'll walk away from this feeling terrible. So he's kind of making me drop again, do you know what I mean? You know, it's kind of, oh. You know. And then he, and he told me a couple of things about himself. Uh, one of them was worse than anything I'd ever even thought about doing. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like I had something on him as well. You know, just enough. You know. Do you know what I was able to tell him the whole truth? And I think if I'd have done this, I know people go to the Catholic priest or psychologist. The book says you can do that, doesn't it? It says you can go and share your stuff. But for, for me, I think if I'd have been approached in any other way, other than with somebody who understood the importance of sharing their own experience, I maybe wouldn't have told the whole truth. Yeah. I told him the whole truth, including the two big secrets, which I now share quite happily with everybody that I sponsor in my exchange with them. I say, these are the two things I didn't want to share. And I'll share them before we do that fifth step. Because loads of people know about that stuff. It's not that, it's not that big a deal, really. But for me, at the time, it was. I walked out of that caravan feeling like a free man. I felt physically lighter. I can remember on my board the following day, like a perfect surf. Absolutely. It was like I had perfect balance. All surfers fall off at the end. Yeah. The sea runs out, doesn't it? I mean, but it felt like that. So I had a wonderful experience, you know, with that fifth step, with my first sponsor. And we, he allowed me to work through the rest of the steps in any way that I wanted to. He did say to me after that fifth step experience that I should continue to take inventory. He made it quite a clear stipulation. He said, from now you should continue to take inventory, though. He never ever stepped on me about it. And, uh, and I learned to continue to take inventory through not taking inventory. That was my experience. You know, I'd, I left that feeling so good that I didn't bother taking any inventory, and after a few months I realised that I probably needed to take some inventory. Yeah. And he carried on being my sponsor, and I'd go down and visit him, and we'd talk on the phone, and we'd kind of we'd do that kind of stuff. And then uh, I was at a meeting one night, and some bloke asked me to be his sponsor. Yeah. He came up to me after the meeting, so I got fired up, you know, after I had these experiences with my sponsor, you know, I got fired up in AA. You know, I was excited about what had happened to me. You know, finding a higher power in my life as an atheist was a, a, a great turnaround. You know, and I felt so good. I felt so clean for the first time. You know, I was excited. And so I'd come to meetings and I'd share this stuff. I was excited about what was happening. And I suppose that was attractive, you know. There was a bloke that asked me after the meeting, uh, he said, would you be my sponsor? And I immediately thought, no. Because <laughs> I didn't like him. I didn't like him at all. In fact, if I could have picked one person in that meeting that I didn't want to sponsor, it would have been him. <laughs> I said, I don't know. I'll have to ring my sponsor and ask him. Hoping that Tony would say, no, no, if you don't like him, son, leave it, you know. <coughs> ain't going to work out. If you don't, if you haven't got a connection, ain't going to work out. You know, that's what I'm thinking. I could say face, you know, in the meeting and all that, with the bloke. And so I got home that night and I rang Tony up. I said, uh, you never guess what's happened to me. I said, uh, some bloke's just asked me to sponsor him. And he says, well, why don't you do it, son? It might make you learn this program you keep going on about. <laughs> So I started to sponsor this bloke. I really didn't know what I was doing, you know. I really didn't know. Uh, but I was willing, you know, I was willing to try. And he didn't stay so that bloke died. Right? Yeah. Not as a result, hopefully not as a result of my sponsorship. I mean, it was a, a while after that he did die. He was somebody that struggled in the fellowship. Things like that. And I, I got asked by other people. He didn't, people started to ask me all the time. You know, I ended up sponsoring lots of people, not really knowing what I was doing. You know, didn't have any structure to the way that I was sponsoring people. I was uh, letting people do what they wanted to do, you know, in terms of interpreting the book. You know, I had a kind of loose framework of how it worked steps. That's all I had, really. And most of them didn't stay sober, you know. 
that's my experience, really. Some of them are still sober. You know, there are some blokes around who, uh, who themselves have got more than a decade of sobriety and are sponsored in their early years. who will have to take through the steps later on as an amends to them. You know, because I didn't really know what I was doing. But that's not beating myself up, giving myself a hard time. You know, I was a willing participant of Alcoholics Anonymous doing my best. You know, that's all anyone can ever do, really, is doing their best. And then, uh, you know, started, other people started getting sober and things like that. And we started listening to, to CDs and recordings and tapes and things of American speakers and things like that. And I got excited about that kind of stuff, you know. There seemed to be kind of other things going on about the big book and stuff like that. I didn't really quite understand and, and all that. And then uh, I started going to a meeting where there was a very, uh, a very kind of direct kind of sponsorship going on, which hadn't been my experience of sponsorship, you know, I hadn't had that. My sponsor, whenever I used to ring him up for life advice, he'd say to me, how am I supposed to know what you're going to do, son? He said, get in your knees and pray and ask, ask your God. I don't know what you've got to do with that. Yeah. And uh, So he never ever told me what to do in my life, not once. Yeah, so I started going to this meeting and then uh, people talking about taking guidance from their sponsor. Um, ringing their sponsor to check what their decision making should be like on a daily basis whether they should go out with a girl or not, whether they should take the job or not kind of life management stuff you know, it seemed very different to what I'd been experiencing I started to question whether I was doing it right yeah. it's very persuasive to sit in a meeting with people all talking a certain way and you don't have that experience yourself and I felt uncomfortable sometimes in their meetings you know, people would openly ask me, who's your sponsor? And I think, oh, what's it got to do with you, really? You know. And so I thought about that. You know, is that something I need to do? Because the blokes I'm working with, most of them aren't staying sober. That was my experience at that time. You know, I worked with a lot of people, most of them didn't stay sober. You know, I'd drive around with a car full of drunks everywhere I went, a car full of drunks. Me, Vic, a car full of drunks. <laughs> So I, I, I thought about it a lot, you know, and there were some things that I couldn't reconcile. And one of the guys that used to turn that meeting, I became friendly with him, you know, I used to go around his flat and he'd talk about what he did as a sponsor and how his sponsor worked with him and things like that. And some of it sounded very appealing to me, you know, having that kind of structure and stuff like that. But the things I couldn't reconcile for myself, and I'm not saying that that style of sponsorship is wrong or bad or anything like that. You know, some people that flourish under it, they absolutely flourish. But there were some lines that people would say, like things like, well, I defer to somebody that knows better than me. And I think to myself, well, what if he doesn't know better than you? How will you know? You know he's a human being, isn't he? You know, how, how will you know and how will he know if he doesn't know better, if he's trying to manage your life for you? you know, I couldn't reconcile that. People will talk about deferring up the lines. If my sponsor doesn't know, he asks his sponsor. And so, because I'm a logical thinker, I think, well, what happens at the top of the line then? Who's that bloke? Where does he go? <laughs> you know, I couldn't, I couldn't reconcile that, you know. And there were some positions that people had around other things and things like that that just didn't sit well with me. So I chose not to go down that path, you know, that type of sponsorship. And, um, but I took on board some of the things that they did use. You know, at that meeting that I went to, you know, I used to go to that meeting and another one where they talked about certain suggestions, six suggestions they called it, and they used to give them out on a card. And I could see how they'd be useful. I mean, I could see. You know, when you talk to people, they say, well, what it is, is we give these to the newcomers, it gives them something to do until they've worked the program. I was thinking, oh, that makes sense. I mean, I've never had them suggestions when I was first sponsored. My sponsor told me that I needed to pray. That's all he told me. So I adopted them suggestions myself, they seemed useful. And I started to pass them on to people that I sponsored. And I found that people started to stay sober for longer. Yeah. That was my experience with that. The people that asked me for help, I give them these suggestions, they seemed to stay sober for longer. Over a period of time, one of the suggestions I dropped. You know, one of the suggestions is to ring two newcomers every day. And I found that, my experience with that was that it wasn't helpful to people. You know, because it become like a tick box thing and be quite insensitive sometimes. 
sometimes a newcomer would end up with 10 phone calls from a group in the morning. You know, and it could be a bit overpowering. But I know people that find their phone calls very helpful and useful. Yeah. But I, I stopped offering that as a suggestion to people. If they wanted to take it on board themselves, it was up to them. So I started offering them suggestions because I'd come into contact with them, found them useful. My sponsor never used them, as far as my way, he still never has. You know, that man. And, then, and I carried on that way. And then uh, I met some other people in AA who talked about using the book as a sponsorship tool. You know, using the big book. I thought, well, yeah, I could do that, couldn't I? I could use the big book. You know, and I started to, to work with people using, like, edited highlights out of the big book. I'd, like, pick key bits out of the chapters that I thought were very important. And I kind of, I'd, I'd do that with them. You know, and I found that actually more people stay sober. You know, so little by little, I was kind of not through any kind of grand design or anything like that, just through saying a prayer or showing me how to be helpful. That's what I used to do. You know, a lot of the mornings I'd say, "Dear God, show me how to be of maximum helpfulness to you and my fellows today." I'd, I'd be just taken down these paths. You know, find new information all the time, and gradually experiment on people and see whether it worked. You know? And um. You know, some people say that, that uh, I remember people saying to me, well, that's a bit dishonest, Dave, isn't it? If you're using stuff that wasn't your experience, isn't that dishonest? I said, well, that's common sense, isn't it? You know, if you come across new information that's helpful, isn't it common sense to use that? It's not dishonest in the slightest. You know. Um, my experience with the suggestions was that, for me, they were suggestions. You know, I... Uh, I wouldn't really worry too much if people didn't do them, you know, and uh, I still don't, actually, you know, because there's, there's a line, isn't there, between uh, offering something as a suggestion, right, and then trying to control the outcome, yeah, if I'm trying to control the outcome with an individual to make him do the suggestions, they're not suggestions, if I'm saying to you that if you don't do them suggestions, I'm going to withdraw sponsorship, I'm not suggesting to you, I'm telling you. It's a fine line, but it's one I think is important for me. You know, so if I offer you a suggestion you don't do it, I'm fine with that. Because I've only suggested it. It's your business that you do. Yeah. I'm not in the business of trying to control anyone. See, I learned through this journey and asking questions of myself and other people that any attempt to control someone is based on my fear. My fear they won't stay sober. My fear that my reputation of a sponsor won't stand up in amongst my fellows because all my sponsees are getting pissed. What will they think of me? So I learned about the suggestions. And then my, my sponsor, he, he won the lottery. And uh, he won, uh, him and his father in law, they, they shared three and a half million quid. And, uh, driving down the road one day, had a phone call, his tone. And he never really rang me often, you know, I'd, I'd rang him, you know, he didn't ring me very often. And, uh, he said, you sitting down, so I said, well, I'm in the car. It's Sunday morning. <laughs> and you know, it was a car that he gave me. Like, he, he gave it to me because my car got smashed up. He was a good bloke like that time, he was a very generous man, you know. And, uh, and I didn't have any money to pay him. He said, he said to pay him whenever I'd got the money. So I'm in the car, and he says, we've had it off, son, I've won the lottery. And he said, oh, what? He said, we've had it off, I've won the lottery. I said, what do you mean? I think he's got a like, hundred quid or whatever. He told me, and he said, uh, he said, on that motor, he said, don't worry about the money for that, son. He said, you keep it. Right. Brilliant, you know what I mean? So my sponsor's got what I want. <laughs> yeah. And he's hung up, and I'm driving down, and I'm thinking, you could have got me a fucking better car on this one. <laughs> One of the other blokes he sponsored got a Merc, you know. <laughs> well, thanks, Tone. Thanks for that. And anyway, what happened to him was that over a period of time he, he eased up on coming to AA. And uh, you know, money can do that, you know, it changes things, doesn't it? You know, and I think he didn't change a great deal. You know, he was kind of quite solid, but his whole circumstances around him changed. The way people were with him changed. And, um, you know, there was some drift there, really. And, I, and I, so I ended up, really, for 
probably a period of 18 months without a sponsor, technically, because it was a, we had a different relationship. It kind of, he wasn't really going to meetings. You know, can you have a sponsor? Don't go to meetings. I don't know. Maybe. You know. But at some point, that to me became not an option. You know, I, I knew that I needed to move on. I knew I needed to find somebody else. And so I did. You know, I found somebody else. I asked another bloke, and he said yes, he'd sponsor me, and he was local. I went through the program again, and he had a slightly different way of doing stuff, and I learned from him. All the time, I'm still working with my blokes, you know, gradually refining what I'm doing, working it out. And uh, eventually, I moved on from that sponsor. I realised there was nothing left he could teach me. You know, I know it's not being arrogant. I think that's part of the journey in AA. You know, for those of you that have been around a while, you may be on your second, third, fourth sponsor. Quite often now, I'm somebody's third or fourth sponsor. You know, and I, I encourage the people that I work with to seek a new experience all the time. You know. uh, my current sponsor now, he, he lives in America. And uh, we have a loose relationship. You know, I certainly don't ring him every day. I think I've rang him three times this year. Uh, it's like a spiritual guide, really, in some respects. Yeah. I don't bring my sponsor with inventory unless it's something that's very private. You know, a lot of you know my wife's in the fellowship. And so for me to share with my fellows, you guys in here, things about her wouldn't be appropriate. Yeah. So there's some things I do take to my sponsor. And because he lives so far away, it's helpful. So, I mean, that is, you know. Because he, he doesn't have to see my wife and be, be involved in her life, you know, knowing stuff about her that he shouldn't know. And I'm respectful of that dynamic. You know, but for other stuff, I'll share with anyone. You know, I'll talk to Ben, talk to anyone, it don't matter. You know, I'm quite open, really, about what's going on in my life, things like that. Okay. You know, there was a, a bunch of blokes around who uh, started working the steps using the Joe and Charlie tapes. And, um, they, I remember speaking to one of them about how he how he sponsored, and he said, "Well, I read through the book with them." I said, "What, all of it?" He said, "Yeah." He said, That's what I do. I sit down with the book, I read it all with them. And I can remember thinking, "That's a good idea." I can remember thinking when he said it, "That's actually a really good idea." What did I think of that? You know, I've been doing this kind of edited highlights thing. You know, I said, "Well, why why do you do it that way?" He said, "Because then I know they've read it, and I know that they haven't missed anything." Common sense, isn't it? You know, I hadn't thought of that. I was seven years, seven years sober, I think, at this point. So I started to do that. Yeah. Started to do that. Every new bloke I worked with, sat him down, started with the doctor's opinion, started to read through the book. I found that more people stay sober. That's my experience. Yeah. So I started to think about, you know, what it means now for me to be a sponsor. What does it mean? You know, all along that journey, I asked that question. You know, do I want to be somebody that is going to try and manage somebody's life and give them advice? I think, well, I've never had a sponsor that's done that. But one of the sponsors that I've had has ever done that to me. And I seem to be able to live my life quite fine. You know, and I realised, actually, at some point, that I don't need to do that. I don't need to try and manage somebody's life for them. Why would I deny them the opportunity to make a mistake and learn from that? You know, and their life is their business. But the problem as a sponsor, if I'm trying to manage other people's lives, is that eventually I might start to think I do know better. See, that's a dangerous place for somebody with an ego. You see. If I know better than other people. See, and I've seen sponsors that go down that path and end up with a hierarchy around them, people that they try and manage or that people account to. But quite often the pressure of that dynamic becomes too much for that sponsor. You know, they don't begin not to share honestly about what's going on in their life. You know, that they've been unfaithful to their wife, they've started using drugs on the side. Because yeah, they can't lose face to these people that look up to them. Yeah. <coughs> Sometimes just the fact that people are always on the phone asking what to do becomes too much for that sponsor. Yeah, he, he, he was okay with it when it was just one or two blokes. But now he's got 12, 13, 14 blokes ringing him up every day. He can't cope. And often then people leave. Hey, hey. Pressure becomes too much and they bail out. So I decided, you know, and because of my experiences and because of what I see, that 
I don't want to do that. And as a result, some of the people that I've sponsored have struggled under my sponsorship. And they really desperately sometimes want me to tell them what to do. They ring me up and say, I've got this, this and this going on, Dave. What should I do? I say, I don't know. I don't know. What do you want to do? Have you prayed? What's your conscience telling you? They never tell them. Never. One bloke once. It's hard, it's hard to keep that discipline. Some people are very good at drawing you into their drama. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a discipline I've learned. One bloke once he asked me, uh, I heard Bill Wilson took LSD seeking a spiritual experience. I was thinking about having a bash at that myself. I, said, <laughs> <laughs> I just said no. <laughs> You know, and uh, you know, I try and practice non-judgment in being a sponsor today. You know, my sponsor practices that. You know, I learn a lot from my current sponsor in being non-judgmental. And I think as a result of that, none of the people I've ever worked with are frightened to walk down my drive. They don't fear my judgment. So I might not speak to them for a year, two years, three years, four years sometimes. You know, blokes come and go. Do you know what I mean? You know. There's not one person that I've worked with that's afraid to come down my drive and he's in trouble. I'll tell you that now. Because I won't judge him. I'll make him a cup of tea. Say, what's going on, mate? I have no desire or need to control anyone. You know? I think it's quite arrogant sometimes. You know, as, a, as a person in recovery, sometimes you see uh, you know, the idea that maybe they do know better. After a couple of years of sobriety, you think you know better. You can manage other people's lives. I still struggle to manage my own life sometimes. I let other people have their own experience. I think it's more respectful, and I'm comfortable with that. And so really, the, the kind of sponsor that I am, so this whole first hour really has been about defining that. Well, it's about defining what is sponsorship to me. It will mean different things to all of you. You all have different ways of interpreting this and going about it. So what am I today as a sponsor? What I am is a person that takes somebody through the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. So when somebody asks me to be their sponsor, that's what I offer. That and that alone. So if they want to continue with that relationship beyond that point, I'll then become what's known as a spiritual guide. And I'm quite happy to wear that hat. You know, in some ways it's the same thing. It's no different. Just the language is different. We use the word sponsor in AA because that's the, the culture of AA. Outside of AA, these people will be called spiritual teachers. That's what they're called. That's what you all are. All of you that are sponsors, whether you know it or not, spiritual teachers. So that's how I define it. That's where I am currently with my sponsorship practice. And I find that I can be comfortable about that. I no longer have doubts that I'll give people the wrong information. I no longer have doubts that I've misled people and maybe have contributed to their suffering. You know, I'm very open and honest about what I offer. I offer them the pure, undiluted, original solution that the first hundred used. And as a result of that, I can have a clear conscience. I'm not giving them advice. I've not told them what to do. I've not tried to offer them something that's outside of the experience of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've just offered them that. And so I go to sleep peacefully. Whether or not people stay sober, whether or not they enjoy their life, see, my part of that deal's done. Yeah. Because what you get, whether you stay sober, whether you guys enjoy your life, will be based upon what you're prepared to do. As long as I'm comfortable that I've told you the right stuff, giving you the right stuff. What you do with that is your business. In the same way that Tony said to me, my recovery is my responsibility. It still is today. It's empowering, isn't it? It's empowering. You don't have to worry about what your sponsor says. You don't have to worry about what the next door neighbour says, or whether something's going to turn up for you, or whether some random events are going to go your way. Just suit up, take action, and you'll get your rewards. That's it for the first hour. Uh, please enjoy your tea break and your lunch, and I'll see you later. Thanks very much.
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.